The following is a presentation of Project Independence and WCWP. Project Independence is the Aging in Place initiative of the Town of North Hempstead. We provide programs and services designed to assist and support the older town residents who wish to remain in their homes as they age. If we don't currently provide a service, we will try and connect you to that service. Call 311 or 869-6311 to get more information or receive services. Welcome to Project Independence and you. And welcome to Project Independence and you right here at WCWP.org, 88.1 FM on your radio dial. Um, you can also access this show and all the others on WCWP Radio, which is a great app um, and really allows you to access all programming on WCWP.org. So today, um, Project Independence and you, we have a, a wonderful, wonderful guest, um, Congresswoman Kathleen Rice. And um, co-host today is, of course, Otto Lose. How are you doing, Otto? Good, good, good. Glad to be here. And we're glad to have you. You're, yeah. You've been the uh, co-host for the radio show for seven months straight now. So Yeah, course, <laughs> it's been <laughs> fun. It's been fun. It really has, it, uh, yeah. you know, doing it from our living rooms and wherever we happen to be, sometimes at the office. Um, but it's just great that we can all um, get together and continue with the radio show and all the other programs that we've been able to do with Project Independence, whether it's virtual or, um, you know, hands-on. So again, um, we have U.S. Congresswoman Kathleen Rice. And Kathleen, we're, we're so excited to have you on the program today and um you know really looking forward to hearing about um of course what's happening what we need to look forward to in terms of um uh, you know the assistance that we need with coronavirus and some of the things that um are coming up you know in in the next few months um so so how how are you doing through coronavirus this whole episode. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for having me. It's good to be with you in auto today. Um, you know, I'm surviving just like everyone else. This has been such an incredibly difficult time. There aren't many people alive today who have lived through a pandemic. And New York was, uh, you know, hit pretty hard in the beginning. We were really ground zero for the virus um, as early as March, uh, which seems like a lifetime ago. Um, so we had to really come up to speed very quickly um, with, I could say, the best way I could put it, with inconsistent support from the federal government. Um, but I, you know, I'd be happy to talk about the things that we did in Congress and the bills that we passed to help counties and states like New York. Every single state was hit hard with this pandemic, every single one. Um, and we're going to be feeling the pain from this um, from COVID-19 for a long, long time. You know, I've spent the last, since March, um, and when we were in lockdown, um, spending a lot of time helping small businesses navigate their way through the Paycheck Protection Program, which was a federal lifeline to help small businesses, which are the backbone of, of my entire community and certainly all of Long Island, to try to help these small businesses stay alive, to help um, them be able to keep their employees tethered to their paychecks and their health care. Um, and we also reached out and tried to help um, all the people who were out of work through no fault of their own. And we were, uh, the government, federal government provided an enhanced unemployment insurance of $600 a week, but that ran out in July and people are still really hurting and don't know when they're going to be able to get back to work. And of course, we had to do everything that we could to support our hospital system and our first responders and our frontline healthcare workers who were so, so um, heavily impacted and, you know, ran towards uh, the virus instead of running away from it. And we had to do everything that we can to support them as well. So um, that's kind of where we are. You know, New York is right now pretty much in an, a reopened phase, although the governor announced a couple of days ago that there are some new hotspots in the state that are requiring him to shut down some schools and businesses for a short time so we can continue to keep the virus under control. Yeah. Yeah, one, we've been. One of the questions I have is I, I, I read and hear quite a bit about 
how small businesses are helped. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of different plans out there, to me at least. Uh, how, what would you suggest if you were a small business? What's the best way to find out what it is that um, might be beneficial to you? You know, how can you sort of cut through the, uh, the possible confusion? You know, what's the best way to do that? That, that's a great question, Otto. I have, I, from the beginning of this pandemic, I had weekly calls with all of the um, small business owners in my district so that I could help them navigate the Paycheck Protection Program, which was um, a way for to, to inject money into small businesses so that they could keep their employees um, on their payroll so that they could pay rent, utilities, um, and help them, you know, because their revenue went to zero basically mm -hmm. overnight. And so that money, um, we were able to help uh, hundreds of businesses in the district access that money. But now the, um, the, the program is, is shut down now. So we need to have another relief package to inject more money into the small business world because the good thing about the Paycheck Protection Program was that the money while in the beginning it might have been considered a loan, if you used it for to pay for certain things like keeping your employees on the payroll and you you know used it to pay rent and utilities, a hundred percent of it would be would turn into a grant that businesses did not have to pay back. Mm -hmm. But that's the issue, Otto, is not impoverishing these businesses, not forcing them to take out loans that they're going to have to pay back when they are, it's gonna take them a while to get up to 100% productivity and, and revenue. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful um, that, that we passed the HEROES Act in the house that would extend that financial help to small businesses because they need it desperately. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, there's talk right now, the president first a couple of days ago said, no way, we're not gonna do another relief bill. And recently, as early as yesterday, he said, no, 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 we're talking about it. So I'm hopeful that we're gonna be able to do it. The Democrats in the house, we did our part. We passed the HEROES Act. And now we're just waiting to see if Steve Mnuchin, the secretary of the treasury and the speaker of the house, Nancy Pelosi can work it out. And hopefully the president will sign whatever bill we're able to come up with. Wow. Critical. Critical. <laughs> Yeah, very critical. I mean, I, I know a lot of horror stories and you know a lot more than we do, but peace places that have just basically opened up like the day that March 16th, like near St. Patrick's Day, and they open up a business and, and all of a sudden they can't do anything. They've invested yeah. several years in getting the business going and money and all of a sudden there's no custom base. There's nobody coming in. Well, so and you know... Otto, and you make a you make a good point. Um, there are certain businesses, especially in the service industry, which are a lot of the businesses in, in our district and on Long Island, that are they ever even ever going to be able to open up again? I mean, you see the restaurant business. I mean, now they can have fifty percent capacity indoors, and they can continue to to do outdoor dining. But how long can that last? And how long can you keep a business going when you don't have when you can't because of the Department of Health's mandate where you can't have a hundred percent capacity um in in your establishment it's very very difficult and to say nothing of like movie theaters and bowling alleys and gyms and places like that and you know even you have your musical entertainment where the venues where they kind of you know didn't really serve food but they just had venues for for yeah. bands and music you know any kinds of entertainment and you know they had to come up with plan b um, a lot of them are closing down uh, to, you know, they had to come up with a way to serve food. So that is, you know, they can also have people come there and, yeah. um, enter, you know, entertainment is, you know, very different where you might've had a large band. Now you might have two on stage and they're kind of separated. So that's, it's really hit that industry, you know, as well. Very hard. Yeah. Well, you have Regal, the movie chain, uh, just said not too long ago that they were closing all their theaters right now. And if you think about that, the space, the property that these large theaters take up, uh, you know, they, they, I mean, if they were all of a sudden shut down, uh, you would wind up with an awful lot of empty property. Absolutely. With, with defunct businesses that are yeah. never going to come back. Right, right. It's and they need help. help. That's the only way they're going to get through it. 
Yeah. So you're right. So, you know, it it's it sounds so bleak, but you know, <laughs> we are learning. You know, just like we talk a lot about what we all learned from Sandy. You know, and how we are able to put plans in place and, you know, realize to be, you know, especially because, you know, we're, we're a senior program and seniors that depend on oxygen and, and making sure that PSEG is there and that families are around and they're, you know, they have a to-go pack, um, all their meds are available, you know, so there's so many things that we learned from Sandy, um, that you know we're ahead of, we're ahead of the game now with with things with hurricanes you know we know you know don't plan don't watch the weather for 2 weeks before you start planning if you see there's something coming our way start right away start there, your planning yes. putting that all in action you know um and yeah. we at with project independence you know we've been extremely yeah. proactive and really kind of you know saying okay a second wave you know it may not be imminent, but what are the things that we learned in the beginning? What are the things that we, um, you know, were shocked, you know, like uh, by, by the end of March, everybody was frantic. You couldn't find toilet paper. You couldn't find paper towel. You couldn't find these, you know, things. So really, you know, we put forth a checklist for our seniors um, with those types of items, you know, and, and also to plan now for, you know, the winter weather. Because if there is a second wave, you know, you have to have, you know, get your salt, get your ice melt now, just start, you know, start preparing. So, you know, that being said, I'm sure that is on all of your minds, you know, too, to, um, you know, and, and kind of, I'd love to hear about what, you know, what you're thinking in terms of, you know, if there's a second wave, how can we get ahead of it, um, you know, and, and help and help everybody? You know, it's, um, that's a really good question, Rebecca. And right now, you know, it, we, we haven't, I wish that we could be talking about, well, is there going to be a second wave? But across the country, there are still states that are going through the first wave right. impact right now. Hospitalizations are going up in, in a number of states across the country. Thankfully, not in New York but they're going up. We have not been able to get this virus under control. So what steps can we take? Well, we are doing everything that we can to make sure that our hospital, the foundation of our healthcare system, our hospitals are strong and have all of the PPE, the personal protective equipment that they need, that we uh, support Northwell, which is the really the nucleus of our medical response to this virus in terms of testing and contact tracing and isolation. Um, but also what, one thing that we've been doing through our the bills that we've passed in Washington is to make sure that we have, um, we invest in our federal nutrition programs, for instance, SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, critically important for the federal government to in inject as much money as possible into programs like that, because we know that we have more food insecure families now than ever since probably the Great Depression. So we have to, um, and this is another reason why we are fighting so hard to get a relief bill right. that will allow inje um, inject federal relief money to state and local government. Um, and our special guest today is Congresswoman Kathleen Rice. And it's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much. There's so much information. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to um, give us the information. Over break, we were talking a little bit about, um, you know, because we are a program that serves seniors, we have a transportation program that also serves seniors and um, people with disabilities can utilize it as well, Project Independence and New Transportation. So in terms of that population, I'm curious to know what types of programs or changes we're doing to kind of adjust to assist with um, the aging population? That's a great question, Rebecca. Thank you for that. Sure. You know, I'd like to talk about the CARES Act, which was the relief bill that we passed at the end of March. 
Um, and I want to tell you specifically how it helps the community that we're talking about here. That bill um, allowed for $1 billion to go to the Department of Health and Human Services to support, specifically to support older adults and people with disabilities during the pandemic. So it's broken down this way. There was $200 million for the home and community-based services to assist older adults who need to shelter in place to minimize the possibility of exposure. And we know that, that that's a, this is the most vulnerable population in terms of this virus. So um, these services help with personal care needs, household chores, grocery shopping, essential transportation, and case mm -hmm. management. That also allowed for a $480 million for home delivered meals for older adults uh, another $100 million for the National Family Caregiver Support Program, which expands a, a range of services that help family and informal caregivers to provide support for their loved ones at home. And it also allowed for $50 million for aging and disability resource centers to connect people at the greatest risks of catching COVID-19 to the services needed to practice social distancing and seek to mitigate issues created by it, such as social isol isolation. We know so many people who are, because we're still stuck at home and certainly a senior population are stuck at home even more so, that you know, isolation can set in. It's really important that we um, still engage this population and allow them to know that you know at some point we're going to get past this. But it's so critically important that we make sure. And and I will you know give you my my website and my phone number, Rebecca and Otto, yes. to share with all of your listeners because I want them to know that. There, is, there are resources that they can access that have been funded through the CARES Act um, that will specifically help this population. Yeah. The navigation is very important. So I think, you know, the getting through the system, if you will. Uh, Absolutely. So it, it, that's something that we should publicize, frankly. You know, Absolutely. That, uh, uh, you know, one of the other areas that keeps coming up with seniors, of course, is the the ongoing rumor that Social Security will be cut and uh, that it's an entitlement and whatever, which is a debatable word, in my opinion. Uh, it's not an entitlement, frankly. I've been paying. Not when you pay for it. It's I'm not. a teenager. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, what is your opinion on, on uh, whether there's a reality to the possibility of a cut in Social Security? Otto, this is a... Um, regardless of who's in the White House, we're always gonna have conversations about Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and things like that. These essential safety net programs that by the way, you're right, Otto. I don't use the word entitlement when I talk about this. I use the word earned benefit. Right. That's right. what it is. It's an earned benefit. We all pay into Social Security. That is not an entitlement. An entitlement is something that you get for free. We're not getting Social Security for free. We are paying into it. Now, despite his promises, President Trump, unfortunately, has pushed policies that have threatened the security and longevity of Social Security and Medicare. If he got his way with, he, he, all he talks about, has been talking about, one of the things that he's been talking about during this whole pandemic is he wants to do this payroll tax cut, the payroll tax cut. He thinks that's a way to help small businesses. It's not. All that's going to do is cut the funding. No more, the, the money is not going to go into Social Security and Medicare anymore, right? If he gets his, got his way with the payroll tax cut, that is what would happen. It would threaten the solvency of Social Security and Medicare. At every turn, I have opposed these cuts. At every turn. What, during a pandemic, the last thing that we should be talking about are cuts to Social Security and Medicare. We have to do everything that we can to defend and support these critical programs so that they stay solvent well into the future. Now, in August, I signed on to a letter that was led by my colleagues, Joe Kennedy from Massachusetts and John Larson from Connecticut that opposed the president's plan to cut payroll taxes um, because of, because of the, how, how it would jeopardize both 
social, the solvency and security of Medicare and Social Security. And I'm also an original co-sponsor of a bill that's called the Social Security 2100 Act. And that bill would provide an across the board increase in benefits for all current and future beneficiaries. Um, it would revise, it, uh, it would be a revised and more accurate cost of living adjustment formula, which we know we have to address and a new minimum benefit established, which would ensure that no one retires into poverty level income brackets. Um, and a tax cut that would um, inure to the benefit of 12 million beneficiaries. So we have um, up to, to this date, I have helped to secure more than $6 million in social security benefits for constituents who needed assistance in filing for disability or early retirement. And I, I want to actually make sure that all of your listeners know that my office is a resource if they're having any difficulty with social security benefits or disability or early retirement, any issue like that, please contact mm -hmm. my office. Yeah, yeah I, I know a number of people whose only source of income in retirement is Social, Social Security. Security, absolutely. I mean, you know, as it is, they're on the edge of, of real poverty. As poverty. A, not yeah. on the edge, they are really in yeah. poverty, especially yes. on Long Island. If you're yeah. only making Social Security, it isn't easy. Yeah, uh, because the cost of living on Long Island, as we know. So, is so the thought of somebody getting a cut in that, I, I have no idea what the percentage of people uh, is that count on Social Security as their only source of income. But uh, I believe there's enough of them that uh, it would really put a stranglehold on people. Yes, you know? yeah, yes. And you know, I, one of the other things that I, I think it's important to mention also um, that I recently voted on, it, it was a bill that would allow Medicare to directly negotiate with drug companies to secure lower prices for up to 250 drugs per year, including insulin. Now, my father was a diabetic till his dying day. I mean, this would be enormous, right? But it would also, the bill that we um, uh, passed would also deliver vision, dental, and hearing benefits to Medicare beneficiaries. We have to, we have to get um, a control over the cost of prescription drugs. And because um, that is, you know, when you talk, Otto, about people literally only living on, on their social security payment every, you know, every month. And they have costs for medications, which a lot of older people do. Um, it's their number one expense. We have to do something to get those costs under control. Agreed. Yeah. Extremely important. It's, you know, it's real, it's disconcerting when a senior can't take, you know, a medication or perhaps they've been taking a medication um, that's been working and all of a sudden they have to go to a different brand. Yes. Not because, not because the doctor wants you to, um, but because the insurance company does. So that's always been a, you know, a, a kind of a disconcerting um, issue too. Absolutely. I well, remember this is, my, this is the I, season to be jolly right now when we change uh, Medicare a gap or advantage programs and that type of thing uh, becomes really important to be able to compare uh, drug costs with one program versus another program. Absolutely. It's a different topic, obviously, than yeah. we want to get into, but Project Independence does have uh, several Zoom sessions coming up where uh, people will be guided on, on how to uh, navigate that system, if you will. That's great. Can I also bring up one issue that is critically important? Um, we are in the census year, and I just want to encourage all of your listeners to please, please make sure that they fill out the census. It is critically important that we do this because there are so many things that the federal government looks to um, to determine how much federal aid goes to each individual state, and that is driven by population. We need to have 100% participation in this census so we don't miss out on the hundreds of billions of dollars. It's actually, I think it's a total of about a trillion dollars in federal funding that is distributed to states based on the results of counting each person in the state. So if we get 67% participation in the census, do the math. Think about how much less money we're going to get to help us with education, um, so many different, you know, all of these kind of programs that we're talking about now. So it's critically important that everyone please respond to the census. We're talking about a very important topic, um, and not just about funding, but about representation. So we were discussing 
the census. Yeah. So I'd love for you to continue with um, the points. That I, I sure will, Rebecca. So um, the census, as we all know, is taken every 10 years, and it is an attempt to identify how many people are living in this country. Um, because because uh, a lot of federal aid is determined, the federal aid that individual states get is determined by population. Now, the Trump administration has been trying to um, move up the date, the deadline for the census. They tried to move it up to September 30th. Um, they lost that in court. And now the deadline, I, and I don't know, I'm not going to try to assume why they wanted to move that deadline up it, during a pandemic which in my opinion is a crazy thing, but we won this fight in court and the deadline will remain what it always was, which is October 31st. A federal judge has said that will stay the deadline. They cannot move it up. So um, there is a phone number that I'm going to give all of your listeners to call up to ensure that you have filled out the census. The number is one 844 Three three zero twenty twenty eight four four three three zero twenty twenty, and for the Spanish line is eight four 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 six eight twenty twenty. So you're either going to get something in the mail, and it's very very simple. Okay, you can do it by mail, which is totally safe and secure. Um, and they ask you, they don't, they're not going to ask a citizenship question. That was another question that the Trump administration tried to get included in this census information. And the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, no, the Constitution does not require a citizenship question. It requires that every human being, every human being, every person be counted regardless of your status. So I don't want people to be afraid to fill them out. They're not going to ask you your social security number, your date of birth. They simply just want to know where are you, this, where do you live, right? Because they send it, mail it to you. And how many people live in your household? You don't even have to give the names of people who live in your household. So you can do it by mail and mail it in. You can do it by phone, as I showed, or you can go to um, the website, which is 2020census.gov. And you can fill it out online. Very, very important. As I began to say right before the break, the reason why it's so, one of the reasons why it's so important, not only because of the federal funding that comes to the state, depending on how many people live here, um, but also our representation in Washington is determined by population. So every state gets two senators, no matter what your population is. But the pop, the, the how many Congress people you get, people like me, is determined by population. Now, New York is scheduled now, we're probably going to lose at least one seat because of the population drain that we've had, primarily upstate, mostly upstate in upstate New York. Um, but, but if we are undercounted, we could lose as many as two seats. Now, that sounds like I'm trying to take care of my job. Um, I'm not gonna be in this job forever, obviously, but the reason why it's so important is because the more voices you have in Washington, the more of everything we get. So it's critically important to make sure that you fill out the census information. And I, I appreciate everyone, you have until October 31st to do that. So if you Suppose you didn't remember whether you did or you didn't, like some people might have that problem. Well, you should call that number, Otto, that I gave, and you can check, they'll, they'll, eventually you can work your way to getting a human being, and they will be able to tell you if you, you know, by, by your address, um, giving them your address, wh whether you have responded to the census or not. You know, many of our listeners may not know um, how often a census is done or how long, you know, if, if you do or don't fill out a census, how long lasting will those results, you know, linger? 10 years, ten every years, 10 sir. years. Yes. So it's, it's, if you add up the money, I mean, it's, it's billions of dollars that we could be missing out on if we don't get 100% participation. Right, exactly. So, yeah. and that's a 10 year gap where we don't have another chance again at this for 10 years. So it's absolutely so crucial that people just fill it out. It's yes. really and simple. You know what, Rebecca, another crucial, crucial issue that we, we should talk about. I hope that you, you don't mind if I just pop in on this issue. Not at all. Today, October 9th, is the deadline to register to vote in New York State. 
Mm-hmm. I don't have to remind your listeners how critically important it is to vote this year more than ever before. Now, to find out if you're registered to vote or to find out where to vote, you can go to voterlookup.elections.ny.gov. Okay, voterlookup.elections.ny.gov. Absentee ballot applications, which of course are going through the roof because of COVID, naturally, right. must be received by the Board of Elections by Tuesday, October 27th. Now you can call the Nassau County Board of Elections at 516-571-8683, or you can visit nassaucountyny.gov to get an application. Now, New York State has an absentee ballot request portal as well. So you can visit, I know this is a lot of information, but I want to make sure people know, absenteeballot.elections.ny.gov to request a ballot online. Now, remember, this year, all you have to do is select temporary illness or physical disability as your reason for requesting an absentee ballot if you are concerned about contracting COVID-19. New York State is one of those states for which you have to give a reason for requesting an absentee ballot. The governor and the legislature decided this year that even if you are not sick, but you are afraid of contracting COVID-19 by going out and voting in person, all you have to do is check the temporary illness or physical disability on your request. Once you receive your ballot, you need to fill it out and send it back as soon as possible because the ballots have to be postmarked by election day, which is November 3rd, in order for them to be counted. Another important fact, early voting in New York State begins on October 24th and it ends on November 1st. There are many locations to vote early in Nassau County. If you do wanna vote in person and you think you can do it safely and you wanna vote in person, you will have the ability to do that as early as October 24th. So you can visit nassaucountyny.gov for the list of early voting sites and times. Now, I have just given a ton of information out there. And if you didn't have a pen with you or you couldn't write it down quickly, I'm gonna give you one number that I want you to have embedded in your brain, which is my office number, 516-739-3008. And we will be able, there's always someone picking up that phone, we'll be able to help you navigate through this, um, this election season, because I wanna make sure that everyone has the ability to vote this year and, and that you can do it safely. Right, Every- Kathleen, we can also give that number out too. So Great. if people call 311 or anybody's listening and missed any of the information, um, we can definitely provide certainly your phone number and probably Great. all the other you know, sites and things that you gave the information for. And right. every vote counts. And a lot of people paid a heavy price so that we have the right to vote. Absolutely, uh, Otto. Uh, I encourage everybody. I know my daughters in particular, uh, we went through the women's suffrage thing not too long ago. And uh, that was not an automatic process. It took a lot of pain for a lot of people to get there. So uh, everybody should vote no matter who you are. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Women's of course, who you about. vote for is is up to yourself. Up but, to you, you know, absolutely. Right, but we obviously have people we would encourage, but this is not a political show. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not, but no, no, no sign language here. So um, <laughs> speaking about women's suffrage, that's 100 years is 20, for 2020. We were, you know, planning to do a lot of stuff outside, but... Um, that didn't work out because of the pandemic, but we are doing a lot at the town virtually. We have all kinds of things for seniors. Um, they can exercise, they can, and, and the beauty of it is that we're using North Hempstead television because a lot of the seniors are not, um, are not techno savvy or you know just prefer using their television. So that's been working out. So it's good that you have this phone number too um, Congresswoman Rice, because, you know, a lot of people are not looking up websites and it's, and it's confusing. It's confusing for, for, you know, yeah. a lot of the seniors. And can I just give a shout out to the fabulous, um, Judy Bosworth, the supervisor of the town. Absolutely. I can't tell you, she is 
one of my favorite people on the planet. She, she, what, what Judy is doing in North Hempstead for seniors is, is absolutely groundbreaking and should be of the, like literally the, the gold standard for what communities can do to help see their senior population. I think that she is just amazing, um, wonderful. And so I just wanted to give a shout out to Judy and also to my good friend, John Ryan. I hope he's feeling well today. And I'm just so grateful for him hooking me up with you, Rebecca and Otto today. Well, thank you. Well, we're, we're both, we're all fans of the people you mentioned, Judy and John. And uh, uh, there's none better than Judy. I think people yeah. have no idea how fortunate they are that they have a person, forget about what political party or whatever. Absolutely. She's just good at what she does and she cares about the people and uh, she's honest and what else can you ask for? Yeah, absolutely, Otto. You're yeah. right. She's and John, um, you know, we love John. It's always great. We love Rebecca and, and John is a, a, a guy who I admire highly. He's, uh, he's so going through a rough, a very rough patch and he's doing it with a, uh, with a lot of dignity. Yes, he's a wonderful, wonderful person. He certainly is. He is. Um, one of the things I wanted to just mention too with the supervisor is with Project Independence, we have monthly advisory committees where we have, we have kind of like broke the town into six to seven regions so that um, when we went townwide with Project Independence, we can provide like a nurse and social work for one region. So every month we had meetings in person with um, residents, senior residents. And because now we're doing it all on Zoom, the supervisor has not missed one advisory meeting. She is on every single advisory meeting. She is, you know, she, she gives out her email address, she, any, she's like, anybody have any questions? I mean, nothing is out, you know, out there. She's just, you know, really been, um, you know, just great during, during, during the pandemic too. So, you know, we definitely agree with you. And, you know, of course with our department and um, all the program in the town does, you know, we didn't get to do Fun Day Monday this year. I'm sure you're familiar with that. I know I, I I there. Well, very familiar wanted to just ask you, is there anything that you wanted to bring up? You did the census and thank you so much for all that information. I know it's extremely helpful, but we just wanted to offer you if there's any information you wanted to provide to our listeners who mostly are, you know, 60 and over. So um, first of all, I, um, I, I hope all of your listeners are home and safe and healthy. Um, one thing I would love to talk about is how important families and social contact is now to the extent that you can do it safely and, and you know, socially distanced and mask wearing and washing hands and all that. You know, one of the um, difficulties in figuring out a plan, shush, I'm sorry, that's my little puppy, um, in coming up with a plan to reopen schools was taking into consideration how many people how many multi-generational households there are, how many grandparents live with their children and their grandchildren. And we don't wanna create a situation where you can't enjoy your life as a family, but also you know, take into consideration that children are going to be out going to school and how can we make sure that we keep that environment as safe as possible for teachers and for students with understanding that, they, that there is this reality of multi-generational households. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, right now there are some schools that are, uh, you know, in, in the hotspots that the governor has identified, one of which is in my district. And we're doing everything that we can to reach out to the schools to offer help and assistance in any way that we can, because it's so critically important that we try to get our children back into the educational setting that we know is most beneficial to them. And that is actually in the physical school. But we do need to make sure that we take care of older grandparents who might be living in a home with the, their grandchildren. So um, that's just a little something I wanted to throw out there because I think it's so important that we do everything that we can, Otto and Rebecca, 
to make sure that we stay in contact to the extent that we can in this pandemic world, whether it's through Zooms or phone calls, or imagine maybe writing a letter. When was the last time you got a letter in the mail from someone? I know that's a little old fashioned, but I'm an old fashioned kind of gal. Um, so I, I just want to remind everyone out there to, you know, try to do everything that you can to stay in contact with people. And my office is a great resource for any, you know, activities that are, you know, like for instance, senior centers that kind of went uh, virtual, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of in person. So hopefully we'll have senior centers reopening again um, when they, when it's understood that we can do that safely. But you know, doing things, coming up with with ways to stay in contact with people is really so important. You know, you mentioned the word contact and uh, virtual. Um, I've had the uh, the need to go visit a sister-in-law at a nursing home over the last uh, since COVID, and it's pretty terrible to be blunt about it. I don't know if that topic ever comes up, but in my opinion, the technology exists that we should be able to do a Zoom, if you will, and the technology on the nursing home room end of it should be there that people can be communicated with, even if you, like now you have to go, we go up to a window, we spend two minutes and we leave. Uh, yes. you, know, you can't talk, you can do FaceTime, but some of the people have a problem. A, you have to have the cooperation of somebody who want, is willing to do it, and uh, B, a lot of times the people who are in the nursing home really can't hear all that great to begin with. Right. So I'm saying that, okay, let's put like a smart TV in the room and make it so that <clears throat> like we are right now, we could be talking to somebody in the nursing home room and they could at least hear us and know that we care who they are and where they are. Uh, Absolutely. Does that ever come up as a, a, a you know, Otto, so you, uh, thank you so much. I wish that I had mentioned this earlier. You know, nursing homes were particularly hard hit. The residents of nursing homes in our district and really across the state were so hard hit with COVID. Um, and, and you had the unimaginable horror of people dying, not being able to have their family around them because these nursing homes were basically in a lockdown situation. So one of the things that I talk about lessons learned from this pandemic, okay? The inequity of the healthcare system that we have. Why are, why are more victims black and brown than white for this pandemic? Why were there such a high number of people in nursing homes? We know that seniors were in that vulnerable age population, but why couldn't we do better in the nursing home setting? And I have spoken to all the, the owners of the nursing homes in my district, and I'm in constant contact with the governor's office. And of course, I have to give a shout out to Laura Curran, our great county executive, who has done such a wonderful job throughout navigating this pandemic. Um, but we have to figure out, to your point, Otto, how we make life better in nursing homes, right? Because that's, that is... For some families, that is the only option there is. Right. And we have to make sure that these nursing homes are going by CDC guidelines and New York State Department of Health guidelines and making sure that they do not, that, that they are completely um, up to date with things like PPE and testing. Um, we have to make sure that people have access to the flu shot. Seniors have access to the flu shot, especially right now. I hope everyone's going and getting their flu shot. Um, but we also have to make sure that, that technologically, just as we have to figure out what if this happens again, what if there is that second wave, Rebecca, that you were talking about before, right. how do we make sure that kids can effectively le learn in a home setting when they don't have access to a tablet or a computer? We have to make sure every kid has access to that if they don't have access to broadband internet service. Why is it that we don't have a technological um, setup in nursing homes for in, in the instance where you have a healthcare break, um, or like a, a virus breakout, a viral breakout in 
uh, the community and you have to go into a lockdown situation as a nursing home, how do you enable your residents to stay in contact with their families? It's not too much to ask to have a hookup, a Zoom hookup for people to be able to have that contact. And so Otto, I thank you for bringing that up because I am going to continue. I'm, I've got a little working group together um, to uh, address the, the deficiencies that we saw in the nursing home setting during this pandemic to make sure that hopefully we never go through this pandemic, uh, a pandemic again, but we have to address all of the shortcomings that this pandemic highlighted, not just um, in the nursing home setting, but certainly in our healthcare, how healthcare is delivered to people in our community and the education that we're giving our children and, and how, how good it is. Is it as good as it should be in every single community? It's, it's very complicated. There's no question about it, but yeah. out of uh, negatives become sometimes right. positives. And, Absolutely, uh, Otto. You know, what, like what you're doing is reflecting back on, okay, what did we learn? You know, right. we went, we learned. Exactly. This thing. and we're not done yet, but uh, let's, let's at least learn something. Absolutely. And, and make it better for everybody. Right. And, and when I, you know, mentioned before about the second wave too, it could just be a continuation of what's happening, you know, not necessarily a second wave, but more the concept of just getting, being prepared for it. So, you know, like we said in the beginning, what we learned from Sandy, what we're learning now, um, you know, those weak spots, you know, that we, you know, in the nursing home, certainly they, you know, socially, they need to do a little bit, do a little bit better. Uh, well, and, and by the way, it's, it's for their, it's in their best, what I have been saying to the owners of the nursing homes, it's in your best interest to make things better because this is your business. You know, you, you don't want people to have such a negative feeling when they hear the word, the words nursing home. You want people to feel like they can send a loved one there and they're going to be cared for as if they would be cared for if they were home. Right. Unfortunately, yeah. I think nursing homes always have that kind of sadder connotation, but, you know, you definitely, like you were saying, you know, can, can make it a little bit more of a comfortable place for that person, you know, who's residing there. Absolutely. And, I mean, uh, I, don't, you know. I don't think you can ever glamorize the idea of being in a nursing home. <laughs> But I you can know. make it, you know, I mean, let's face facts. It's not a good place. Uh, you're, you're in bad shape usually when you go there. Uh, yeah. But you can try to make it as pleasant as possible. Right. And at least be able to stay in contact with people. Otto, and let me also just say that there are more people going into that senior category Right, I'm 55. Oh, yeah. I got my first AARP notice on my 50 whatever birthday. But that population, the baby boomer population, is the largest population in this country. What are, people are living longer, thank the good Lord. But what are we doing about making sure that people can age in place if that's what they want to do, but also if they can't, that there are viable alternatives for this population that is the biggest population in the country right now. Right. 10,000 people a day are turning 65. So I guess the end of the baby boom was like, they consider it to be 64, 65. Yeah, I just missed the baby boomer, right? Right. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge number. It's a huge number. And, you know, and, and a big difference too is a lot of those, um, even, even well into their 70s, and Otto, you can attest to this, they're still working. Well, I'm a little past the 70s, so. Well, I, well I'm saying, but you, you work. Like it. You're still working. You You're know? a kid when you're 70. That's, that's easy. <laughs> 70 is the new 40. Definitely. Yeah. Well, we've, discuss, we've discussed that too. I mean, there's a, first of all, there's a little luck involved. You have to have good health, which is key. Yes. Sometimes you can help that. Uh, you can help your health, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but then you need a little help from the man up above too. Uh, and uh uh, attitude and how you approach getting older. Uh, you know, I never use the word old. I always use the word older. You know, I'm older. That means I can still get older, you know, but if I'm exactly. old, I can't, you can't go past <laughs> old. <laughs> you know? what? So, oh, yeah, you know, there's a lot of mindset involved, I think. And I don't know, we've talked about this on the show a few times, you know, attitude and, uh, right. And, towards life and uh, you know you hear 
Christina's little article about awe walking, A-W-E. When you take a walk, you walk in awe. You, you look yeah. around you in awe about what's out there. And I think that's how you kind of have to approach things. We are in a place that requires really looking at the positives. And there's a yes. lot of awe out there to look at. You know, just look up at the sky. I mean, it's... Right. You're in awe, you know. Otto, I totally agree with you. And it also is making me like seeing all the suffering that has gone on with over 200,000 people lost to this virus. It really makes me, reminds me of the words that my mother and father always said. Of course, they had 10 children. I'm the seventh of their 10. Um, they're, they have both gone to their eternal reward. But they always used to say to all of us, all of us kids, count your blessings. And I have done that every day since that we have entered this pandemic. Wow. So we've come to the end again of this, um, of this hour. Kathleen, we will, we will have to have you back again. You've been- I would a, love to come back. Um, we had quite a show today with Congresswoman Kathleen Rice and Otto Loos co-host, Christina Liu, the extraordinary- Fabulous Rebecca Liu. Miller. Thank you as always for um, being an awesome host and, of the- and a, and a shout out to John Ryan. Who Absolutely, we love him very much. We love John Ryan. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. You've been listening to Project Independence and you here at WCWP.org.